Hi, I'm Jonathan. I think most of you probably know me. Maybe some of you don't. Um, but yeah, graduated from here three years ago. Um, I'm just glad to be back. So I want to start with a story that I've recently heard. It was kind of funny, but pretty concerning. So there was an evangelist who was taking a trip to Dallas. And of course, he, he needed to fly. So he booked a flight, got on the plane. And like any good Christian, he started a conversation with the person beside him. The person beside him was a nice lady with a, with a small child who kept screaming and screaming. And uh, he just tried to talk through it and everything. And so he got through the conversation, and at the end, he's like, excuse me, ma'am, um, if you were to die today, do you know where you would go? And she sat there for just a second. She's like, I know where I would go. I would go to heaven. I'm sure of it. And he's like, okay, that's great. Uh, so if you were to die today and go to heaven, and God were to ask you, why should I let you into my perfect heaven? what would you say? The lady sat there for a second, and then a minute, and then it turned into five minutes of her just thinking, what would I say? All of a sudden, it was like a light bulb went off in her head. She's like, I know what I would say. I would tell him my mom used to be a Sunday school teacher. Now, you can hopefully see the problem with that, right? This lady was so unaware of what salvation was and what heaven was and the standard that she said, I think I can get into heaven because my mom used to be a Sunday school teacher. So I want to ask you that question today. Um, before, we, as, as I pray, I just want you to think about if you were to stand before God and he were to ask you why he should let you into heaven, what would you say to him? Just think about that. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this evening. Thank you for this opportunity that I have just to be back here and speak to this group. Lord, I pray that you would put me aside and just speak through me. Um, just open their hearts to hear your word and see the Holy Spirit moving in their lives and make those aware that uh, if they don't have the Holy Spirit, make them aware of that um, and just that they would be attentive to your words. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So you've had a second to think about that, um, but as we get into it, keep thinking of what your answer would be. But I want to start off by looking at what I call pathetic grounds for assurance. My title today is Eternal Life Assurance, not life insurance. Life insurance, if you want life insurance, go talk to Ben Anderson. I'm sure he knows about that. But this is eternal life assurance. So what are some pathetic grounds for assurance? Let's look at Matthew 7, 21 through 23. I can pull it up real quick. Matthew 7, 21 through 23 says this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. See, we, one thing that we cannot depend on to get into heaven are the things that we have done. We can't say, Lord, haven't I done this? Haven't I prophesied in your name? Haven't I gone on mission trips to bring you glory? That's, that's something in Matthew that Jesus says, we can't depend on what we've done to get us into heaven. Some of us may be sitting there thinking, you know, I've been at church my whole life. I come to church, so that means I'm, I'm probably a Christian, right? I'm probably saved. I'm used to going to church. I think saved people go to church, so I'm probably there. That may be some of you. Uh, some of you also might think, you know, my parents were Christians, so I've kind of inherited this religion. I mean, that's how I was. I grew up in a Christian home. So maybe some of you were like that. You grew up in a Christian home. You're like, I think I believe the same things as my parents, so I might, I might be saved. I feel like I am. That might be the, the heart of some of you today, too. Um, others of you say, hey, I volunteered for stuff. Like my youth group maybe does some, does some uh, like volunteer activities that I've volunteered for. So, I mean, that makes me pretty good. I think that's a good evidence that I'm saved, right? Um, and then others of you are like, hey, I've even gone on mission trips. You know, that's, that's got to count for something, right? Um, so we're keep, we keep looking for evidences that aren't fully ground grounded in the right thing for our salvation. Others of us, this, this, this was my biggest problem. Um, even, as I, even as I'm a Christian and growing in my Christian faith, I made it a big goal that I wanted to have a consistent devotional life. And maybe that's you too. Maybe that's you. But I found that as I did that, which is a good thing, you want to have a consistent devotional life. I'm saying that's a really good thing. Um, but as I did that, and someday I wouldn't feel like doing it, I would, I would put so much stress on reading the Bible, that my motivation was in the wrong way. I was like, oh, I have to do this. Or subconsciously, I'm like, maybe I'm not going to get saved. I, I didn't truly believe that I wasn't going to get saved, but I put the wrong motivation on, on my devotional life. Like, I didn't want to miss a day because I wanted to check it off. 
Um, so maybe that's some of you. You're, you're subconsciously thinking that your salvation depends on a consistent, consistent devotional life. Um, and then others of you, this is a big one. This one I've struggled with a lot. Um, this is, this is, this, I hope this wakes some of you up. Some of you think you're truly saved because of a prayer that you said one time. Maybe it was a prayer that you said in BBS or camp. That you're like, I, I remember the day that I said this prayer, so I'm, I'm pretty certain I'm saved. Or some of you maybe even say, I said this prayer at camp in VBS, or I said this prayer one time with my parents, and I even got baptized. Some of you are saying, like, that's, I, I know I'm saved because of that. And that's, that's me. That's been me for a long time, and I'm still really struggling with, with some of that. But to tell you the truth, a prayer, words, and even getting baptized doesn't mean you're truly saved. So... I kind of hopefully that wakes some of you up a little bit, and I hope you uh, can listen to the things I'm saying um, later as I get into this message. Um, so that's one thing that we can't depend on our salvation. It's something that we've done. The next thing, we cannot depend on what we haven't done. Uh, Jesus tells a small little parable in Luke about a Pharisee and a tax collector. The Pharisee stands up in the middle of the church at the front of the stage, and he's saying, Lord, thank you that I am not like this tax collector. Thank you that I haven't stolen. Thank you that I haven't murdered anyone. I pray every day. I fast. I do, I do all the spiritual things. Thank you that I am not a sinner like that tax collector. Meanwhile, the tax collector is in the back on his knees, tearing his clothes and saying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And you know who Jesus said was, was more glorified? You know who Jesus praised because of that? Jesus praised the tax collector because he had a humble heart and he recognized his sin. So, so the Pharisee said, Lord, I haven't done these things. I'm not like this tax collector. So he was depending on his, what he hadn't done to be saved. Um, some of us maybe have said, you know, I haven't stolen anything. So, I mean, I'm probably in a pretty good position. I feel like people who, people who go to hell are people who have stolen. Or another thing is, you know, I, I haven't had sex before I was married. I haven't participated in any sort of immorality. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're even like, you know, I haven't murdered anyone, so I'm probably pretty good. I'm probably doing a good job. Others say, you know, I haven't done drugs or I haven't given my soul to an idol. To tell you the truth, this is beside the point, but we've actually done all of those things in small ways. Um, but anyways, we can't depend on the things that we say we haven't done. Because even a small sin, even the smallest sin that we can think of, is a capital crime against a holy God. So we cannot depend on what we have not done to be saved. If you depend on these things, these are the things that even you might subconsciously put your assurance in. Just let me tell you this right now. That stuff, the stuff that maybe you think you've done or the stuff that you haven't done, that's sinking sand. And that's not going to lead you to where you want to be. God calls all of our good works that we do apart from him dirty rags. Our dirty rags can't hold a 20-ton brick that is our sin, that is the weight of our sin. And yet we still dare to rest our eternity on those things. So you might be asking me, can we even be sure of our salvation then? Like if I can't look back and see these things or the things I haven't done, can I even be sure that I'm saved? If, if I remember that prayer that I said, isn't that pretty good uh, evidence of my salvation? It could be, but that's not what we're looking for. That's not true evidence of your salvation. So the first thing I want to point out, true Christians enjoy worshiping God. That's the first point. True Christians enjoy worshiping God. 1 John 1, 3 says this, What we have seen and heard, we also declare to you, so that you may also have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So here John is saying, hey, listen to this. Come have fellowship with us. Our fellowship is with the Father and the Son. Come join us. Come have fellowship with us. And unbelievers are not interested in doing that. They're not interested in coming to church. They're not interested in worshiping God. They ignore the invitation to come fellowship and worship God. John 4, 23-24 says this, The hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. And John 3, 6 says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So true worshipers worship the right way and with the right thing. In order to worship this in spirit and truth, like John 3, 6 says, in order to worship in spirit, you must be born again of the spirit. And when you worship in spirit and truth, 
You can see the evidence of your salvation as the Holy Spirit leads you to worship Christ. So improper worship is anything that does not come from faith in a sincere heart. Now this is me a lot, but if any of you were kind of standing down there, or you find it regular that you're standing down there and just singing or even goofing off, um, that is not worshiping in spirit and truth. And not to scare some of the actual believers in here, because I know that I've stood down there before, I've been distracted, I've had an absent mind, but you know in your heart if you truly enjoy worshiping God. True believers enjoy worshiping God. So what is proper worship? Proper worship comes from a sincere heart and faith. One way you can do this is by preparing your heart before worship. Ask the Lord to soften your heart and to, to make the song coming from your heart to be pleasing to Him. Um, and then another thing, think about the words and sing them. Uh, this is a big thing. It is not a matter of reading and repeating the words on the screen, but it's how you move the words from the screen to your mind, preaching it to your heart and sending it back to God in praise. It's not just a simple seeing the words and singing them and trying to hit the right notes. It's, it's, it's a whole heart action. That's proper worship. And worship doesn't also just have to be singing. Worship also involves obedience to God. So you know if you've ever enjoyed serving God out of love or if you've only done it because you seemed like the project was fun. Or you know that um, if you went on a mission trip, if you went on a mission trip to glorify God or just because you thought it would be fun. So let me encourage the believers in the room also. Start worshiping in spirit and truth. Praise God for his salvation when you sing and thank him for his mercy as you obey and serve others. Um, that's the first point. So true believers enjoy worshiping God. The second point is this, recognition and repentance of our sin. If you're a true believer, you will recognize and repent of your sin. 1 John 1.8 says this, If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. I want to tell you about a story of a man who just built a brand new house. He designed it in, in the perfect way that he wanted to. He had a, an indoor pool. He had a man cave. He even had a movie theater in his room. And he has this huge open area, living room. And then in his bedroom, he had a beautiful ceiling with exposed wooden beams that kind of gave it like a nice log cabin feel. One day, his yard care workers came over and they said, I think, I think we found some termite hills. What looks like termite hills in your backyard. You might want to check it out. And the guy dismissed it. He's like, no, nah, it's probably fine. It's a brand new house, brand new property. It's probably fine. A few weeks later, his son, who was an electrician, came over to help him with lighting in his, in his ceiling. And he noticed that some of the wooden beams were kind of weak, either from rotting or, or chewing or something like that. And, and he, told, he told his dad, he's like, dad, the, the ceiling's getting weak. He's like, nah, I'm sure it's fine. The house is pretty new. There's no termites. We think it's termites. There's no termites. And then there was a, there was a, a flood a few weeks later so the housekeepers ran to the house, went to the basement to make sure there was no water in the basement. And they heard what sounded like something chewing away at the ceiling above them. So they ran upstairs and said, hey, there's something going on in your house. You should pay attention to these signs. And the guy's like, no, I'm sure it's nothing. It's nothing. So a few weeks later, the guy decided to throw a party. He invited a bunch of guests, a bunch of neighbors. Most of them stayed outside and enjoyed the provided refreshments and the live music. But the guy invited a few of them in for a tour. And as the guy was giving them a tour of the house, the people on the outside stood and watched as the guy's house collapsed on him and a few of his best friends. So as you can see, this guy ignored all of the signs that his house was being destroyed by something, that was being destroyed by termites that people were pointing out. He ignored all the signs. Sin is like this. If we let sin go undealt with, it eats away at a person. Eventually, that person's house will collapse. And when it does, it won't only hurt the person, but also the people he loved the most. And on top of that, everything wrong with the person's house will be on display for the whole world to see. When you refuse to acknowledge sin, even when all the signs point to it, you set a trap for yourself. Your sin will eventually rot out your supports and all the strength and pride you thought you had, and your house will come collapsing down and you'll hurt the closest to you and the ones you love the most. And the whole world will see the ugliness that you've been refusing to deal with in your house. So the bottom line is this. Believers recognize they have sin, and they fight sin, and they, and they fight to live for God. When believers confess their sin, 
God is faithful and just, and he will forgive that person of their sin and even help them remove it. So if you have sin and you're ignoring it and you feel no conviction over your sin, you may not know the Lord. That's a good sign that you don't know the Lord if you, if you don't have any conviction for your sin and you're not recognizing your sin. So that's the second point. You recognize and repent of your sin. Third point is this. True believers love others and they love being together in the church. 1 John 2, 9-11 through says this. The one who says he is in the light but hates his brother or sister is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother or sister remains in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother or sister is in darkness, walks in the darkness, and doesn't know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. And 1 John 3.14 says this, We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers and sisters. The one who does not love remains in death. So this is another question to ask yourself. Do you enjoy coming to church? Do you enjoy being in the house of God with those who claim to believe the same thing as you do? Do you find that church brings you together? And do you enjoy being with God's people? I know many of you like to come to youth group for different reasons. I, I fell, I fell um, to a lot of these reasons myself. Some of you are here because you've found interest in a girl or a boy, and you're like, they're here, so I'm going to come. That's, a, that's a, a pretty big one, I think, among a lot of you. Some of you say, oh, the food's great. I know Becky cooks great snacks. She always brings good snacks. Um, so maybe you, some of you are like, yeah, I want to come for the food. I know I would do that. Some of you think the games are really fun, so you come for the games. You're just here for the games. Others, you say, my friends are here, so I'll come. And then some of you, this might be a reality that it's just simply better than home. You don't want to be home, so you come to church. And these, are all, these are all good reasons to come to church, but if they're the sole reason you come to church, you're not going to church for the right reason. You may not be a Christian if you're going to church for the wrong reasons, and you have no true desire to be in the house of God with the people of God. As Christians, we should have a desire to be in the church and serve the church. We should want to come to church because we can be in the house of God with the people of God. If our focus in coming to church is not on God and his people, we come to church for the wrong reasons. So that's, that's another one. You come to church and you enjoy being together in the church. The fourth reason is this. The fourth evidence of salvation is this. You have a hatred for the things of the world. 1 John 2, 15-17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, and the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride in one's possessions, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world with its lust is passing away, but the one who does the will of God remains forever. So there's another question to ask yourself. Do you find yourself recognizing the things of the world? You know, lust, greed, jealousy, gossip, and do you find yourself running away from those things and running towards what God has for you, running towards the things that are good, admirable, praiseworthy? Do you pursue the good things of God and do you obey Him? Or do you seek the, the things of the world and indulge in them? There's a clear boundary line here. There's a boundary line. You're either on the side of, I see evil and I'm going to run from it. I see, I see wickedness. And I'm going to run from it. I'm going to turn away from that because I know this is wrong and I want, to I want to please God. Then on the other side of the line is you have no regard for the things of God and you run towards the, towards the pleasures of the world and you indulge in them. There's, there's two different outcomes to that line too. If you, if, you know that, if you know the things of God and you pursue the things of God, that is great evidence that you have the Holy Spirit working in you. But those of you who have no regard for the things of God, and you indulge in, in the things of the world. That's not, that's not where you want to end up. That's not going to lead you to where you want to be. That path leads to eternal separation and hell. So, which side of that line do you fall on? That's a big question to ask yourself. Do you find yourself pursuing the things of the world or the things of God? The next point is this. God's Spirit testifies with our spirit. This is, this is, the, this is the biggest point for me, that I've, that I've come to um, enjoy in my life. Uh, God's Spirit testifies with ours. 1 John 3, 24 says this, The one who keeps his commands remains in him, and he in him. The way we know that he remains in us is from the Spirit he has given us. 
1 John 4, 13 says, This is how we know that we remain in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. And Romans 8, 15 through 16 says, For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. If you're a Christian, God has given you his spirit. His spirit is the one that that calls on us to call out to God. Like that verse says, do you find yourself crying out to God and saying, Father, Father, is that something you find yourself doing? I know maybe some of you really doubt whether you're a Christian or not. That's, that's, that's okay. I can confidently, because of this, because of this point, this point uh, points out truth, I can confidently stand up here in the most humble way possible and tell you that I am confident that I am saved because the Holy Spirit in me is testifying with my spirit that I am a child of God. Now, I know some of you might be kind of concerned because you're like, I'm pretty sure I'm saved and I'm pretty sure the Holy Spirit is in me but I don't feel like there's any sort of spirit telling me anything right now, which is totally okay. Um, let me tell you this, though. Doubt can spiritually cripple someone. If, if Satan can get you to doubt your salvation, you will be caught up in, I have to do good works to be saved. I have to, I have to do this to be saved. And I'm always going to be nervous whether I'm going to heaven or not. That could, that could spiritually cripple someone. So don't be nervous that I'm saying, I, I know for sure that I'm saved because I have the Holy Spirit testifying with my spirit that I'm saved. Um, if, you, if you are doubting, you should be able to, if you're a Christian, you should be able to look back on your life and see how the Holy Spirit has grown you up until this point. So if you're experiencing a moment of doubt, there should be some things you are able to look back on and see, wow, I know that the Holy Spirit was working, me, working in me in these different ways. And that would be a good evidence of your salvation. So I encourage you to, if you're doubting, this is a big thing. I know I've struggled with this. I know I've talked to people, even at my school, who, who struggle with um, doubting. Um, it's a big thing, but, but you should have evidence in your life to look back on and, and, and know that you are a Christian. Ultimately, though, apart from all of these good evidences that you are a Christian, ultimately, this is the biggest one. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. The greatest evidence of our salvation is found in the promise of God. And God promises that if you believe in His Son and repent and turn from your sin, you will be saved. So if you have done that, you can be sure and rest in God's promises that you are saved. Now, there are some different views on this, um, but I'll just say mine. I know there's, there's differing opinions. Um, but I believe that once you're a Christian and you've, you've received the Holy Spirit, you are eternally secure. You are, you are saved, especially if you, if you receive the Holy Spirit and you continue in, in the ways of God. Um, John 6, 37 through 39 says it like this. Jesus said, Everyone the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And get this, this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of those he gave me, but should raise them up on the last day. This is why I believe that once you receive the Holy Spirit, you are eternally secure, because God, Jesus, came to do the will of the Father. And Jesus does the will of the Father perfectly. And the Father's will is that none of those who come to him should be lost. So that's, 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 that's a differing point of view, but... I believe that if you truly accept the Lord and you receive the Holy Spirit, you are secure. So if you're doubting, if you're struggling with doubt, and you know you've put your faith and trust in the Lord, you can rest on his promises that he will, he will see you through to the end. and He will, he will uh, let you be in heaven with him forever and glorify him. So what are some application points of kind of what I've just talked about? I feel like I, went, I definitely went pretty fast. Um, but the first thing I want, I want to encourage you to do is examine yourself. Are you producing these evidences? I hope you can open your eyes to see some of you who, who aren't actually saved but think you, think you are saved. Maybe, again, you think you're saved because you're at church or because you have a Christian family. 
Open your eyes and search your heart for yourself. Are you producing these fruits of the Spirit? For those who surely are, I want to encourage you to keep doing it. Keep doing these things. Pray that you would continue to grow in these areas because this is evidence to your own heart that God is working in you. These things are ways in which you can do what God has made you to do and allow the Spirit He has given you to work His purpose in your life. If you continue in these things, if you continue in these, the ways of the Holy Spirit and the way He's leading you, that's evidence to your own heart to look back on and say, yes, I can see the Holy Spirit working in me. I know that I'm saved. For those of you who are not producing these things, for those of you who really don't enjoy coming to church, you don't, you don't feel the Holy Spirit moving in you, you don't enjoy worshiping God, for those who are not producing these evidences, I want you to examine yourself. Just like the guy whose friends warned him about the termites, is God moving in your heart and showing you that you need him? Is there a tugging on your heart to seek Jesus and find him? If there is that tug, let me explain what you can do with it. First, if there's a tug, you can either choose to ignore it and keep living the life that is separated from God, and that will eventually lead to death and punishment and hell forever. That's one, that's one path you can choose. Or you can choose to give in to that tug and seek Jesus. If you want to give in to that tug and seek Jesus, here's a simple gospel. Here is who Jesus is. You and I were created in the image of God by a perfect, holy, and loving God. We were created by God for God to be in a relationship with Him and to glorify Him in a perfect relationship with Him. But you and I chose sin And because you and I choose sin and we sin, that separates us from God. And the Bible says that our sin makes us worthy of death. The wages of sin is death. But God saw that you and I chose sin. He saw that we were separated from Him. But He sent His only Son, Jesus, to live a perfect life that you and I could not live and to die on a cross to take the punishment for our sins. And Jesus died, was buried, but he, raised, he rose again three days later. And as he rose, that was an evidence that God's wrath was satisfied with the death of his son. And because Jesus rose again, he conquered sin and death. And now he has promised that who, all who believe in him will have eternal life. All who believe in him and repent and turn from their sin will be saved. So if you feel that tug and you see, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, have these evidences of salvation. I'm not producing the fruits of the Spirit. I don't enjoy coming to church. I don't enjoy worshiping God. Open your eyes to see. This is what you can do. This is, this is, this is a path you need to jump on. I, I, don't wanna, I didn't want to teach this message. I was a little bit nervous about doing this because I didn't want to cast doubt on a lot of you because I know that it can be very easy, especially some people who are like newly saved, it can be really easy to doubt. But I didn't want to do that I wanted to teach you this message because I wanted to present a crossroads to you. So for those of you who are unsaved and you're going on a path like this, I wanted to present a path like this that you can see, hey, I'm going on the wrong way. I need to jump over here and go this way. And for those of you who are saved, I didn't want to make you doubt and be nervous either, but I wanted to make you aware of the opposite, aware of what you came from. And so you would be encouraged to keep going on the way you're going. Keep going in that direction. Um, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of questions that might arise from this. So I hope I didn't leave you with any questions, but uh, I'll be here for a while. So if you guys do have questions, or if you do want to seek that, seek that, that tug that's, that's hopefully tugging on your heart, um, please, please come talk to me. Um, because I'll, I'll sort of close by saying this. If some of you are worried about living a life for God because you're, you're worried about all these constraints that you feel like is going to be on you, um, like you think, oh, I can't do these certain things, and it's just going to be so much harder and it's not going to be fun, the Bible says that God's, that God's law is not burdensome. And those who follow it, I forget the verse, I wish I would remember it, but those who follow it overcome the world. That doesn't sound hard to me. That's good. That's a, that's a good thing. His, his laws are not burdensome. So take heart in the fact that you can do this. You can choose life. 
and, and I'll, I'll definitely close by saying this. All these different things that I said, um, true believers enjoy coming to church, true believers enjoy worshiping God, they, true believers repent and turn from their sin. These things, the Bible does not require the perfection of them. Otherwise, we'd all be perfect because we're, no, we're not perfect. So the Bible doesn't require the perfection, but it requires the presence of these things in our lives. So if you, if you can't see these things in your lives, you may not be truly saved. But the Bible uh, requires the presence of these things. So as you go home tonight, examine yourself. Are you producing these things? Do you have these evidences in your life? And I say these things not, to, not so that you would start doing them, because doing these things do not produce faith. These things are an evidence of faith, right? So I can't, and I can't make myself enjoy going to church to try to produce faith. All of these things are signs that you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian, you're not, these things are not going to come about. So I encourage you to think about these things. Um, go home tonight, examine yourself, and decide, hey, I need to take a different path. I need to seek the Lord. Or some of you might be saved. You're saying, yes, I see the evidence of the Holy Spirit in my life. So think about these things, and I'm just going to pray for us, and we'll be, we'll be good. Lord, thank you for opening our eyes. Um, thank you for, for making us aware of, of what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. I pray that you would help us to examine and see for ourselves if we are on the way to life, if we've chosen your Son and we, we reject the things of the world, or if, we, if we're running full speed, head first into hell and death, would you help us to jump on the right path? Would you help us to see our sin? And, and for those of us who are saved, would you help us to continue on that path until we see you face to face? Be with us as we go out of here and open our hearts and soften them so that we can make the right decisions and follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.